Well, as all of you who are regulars know, we've been in Genesis for quite a while. Uh, oh, over a year, at least. Um, and uh, today, and for a few Sundays forward, we'll see how we're going to have a little bit of a break from Genesis. Uh, and uh, today, I want to go from Genesis 17, where we were last time. So instead of going to Genesis 18, which we were kind of going through today, I want to go to Acts 17, from Genesis 17 to Acts 17. And I want us to see here in the New Testament, in the preaching of Paul the Apostle, I want us to see basically how, how grounded he is in those things that we have been keeping learning, uh, kept on learning in the book of Genesis. How foundational the book of Genesis is to our Christian faith and to our Christian witness in an ungodly pagan society in which we live in today also. Paul preaching in Acts 17, specifically there from verses 16 through the end of the chapter. This is what I want us to look at, look at today and uh, learn and be reminded of how we should uh, conduct ourselves, how our witness, how our message should sound and uh, look like in that sense. What, what are the kind of the key uh, pieces of our Christian message, especially in a pagan society that does not believe the word of God, that rejects the word of God and, and mocks the word of God. What should our Christian witness look like and how is that founded in the book of Genesis which we have been looking at and will continue to look at uh, even though uh, we take a little break at this point. So, let me read the text to you as we begin and then we'll walk through it and, and see what we can learn uh, from this portion of God's inerrant word. So, Acts chapter 17, verse 16. Now, while Paul was waiting for them at Athens, his spirit was provoked within him as he saw that the city was full of idols. So he reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews and the devout persons and in the marketplace every day with those who happened to be there. Some of the Epicurean and Stoic philosophers also conversed with him. And some said, what does this babbler wish to say? Others said, he seems to be a preacher of foreign divinities because he was preaching Jesus and the resurrection. And they took him and brought him to the Areopagus, saying, May we know what this new teaching is that you are presenting? For you bring some strange things to our ears. We wish to know, therefore, what these things mean. Now all the Athenians and the foreigners who lived there would spend their time in nothing except telling or hearing something new. So Paul, standing in the midst of the Areopagus, said, Men of Athens, I perceive that in every way you are very religious, for I as I passed along and observed the objects of your worship, I found also an altar with this inscription, To the unknown God. What therefore you worship as unknown, this I proclaim to you. The God who made the world and everything in it, being Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in temples made by man, nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything, since he himself 
gives to all mankind life and breath and everything. And he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth, having determined allotted periods and the boundaries of their dwelling place, that they should seek God and perhaps feel their way toward Him and find Him. Yet, He is actually not far from each one of us, for in Him we live and move and have our being, as even some of your own poets have said, for we are indeed His offspring. Being then God's offspring, we ought not to think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone, an image formed by the art and imagination of man. The times of ignorance God overlooked, but now He commands all people everywhere to repent. Because He has fixed a day on which He will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed. And of this he has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. Now when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked. But others said, we will hear you again about this. So Paul went out from their midst. But some men joined him and believed, among whom also were Dionysius the Areopagite and a woman named Damaris and others with them. This is the well-known uh, situation of Paul at Mars Hill, as it's often referred to, uh, the Areopagus. Uh, basically, the, they would meet at the a hill of Ares, Mars Hill. That's where they, I think that maybe the King James uses Mars Hill in the translation. Paul in front of this council in Athens. And what he says and how it's received by them. What can we learn from this? Well, first of all, let's start there in verse 16. Uh, like you see, as I read, it says, now while, now while Paul was waiting for them, who was he waiting for? Well, you just go backward one verse and you see the situation. He, it says there, verse 15, those who conduct, uh, conducted uh, Paul brought him as far as Athens and after receiving a command for Silas and Timothy to come to him as soon as possible, they departed. So he's waiting for Silas and Timothy, his spiritual uh, children in the faith. And Paul is waiting in the city of Athens. So in some ways, uh, we can see here uh, how a Christian man, a uh, Christian apostle here, the Paul the Apostle, what does he do when he finds himself in a situation in an, a pagan city and he's waiting? What does he do? How does he spend his time? Does he just sit alone quietly and do nothing? No. As we'll see, he walks around and he then engages people with the truth of the gospel. But as he's walking around, as he's looking around this great city of Athens, and Athens was a kind of a center of Hellenistic or Greek thought, like, like kind of a, the, the, one of the greatest cities, so to say. And apparently at this point, in some ways, Athens, their past was greater even than their present, but they were still riding in many ways on the, on the, um, uh, what's the uh, reputation uh, that they had even from the past. This center of Greek thought, culture, philosophy, religion, and art. Uh, and so he walks around and in many ways, uh, may maybe many of you, if, you, if you're interested in history, you'd be like, oh, I wish I could have been there and seen all the things and what are statues and things. I'm sure there's a lot of beautiful things and, you know, uh, things, uh, very skilled works of art and so forth. And he sees that 
And I'm sure to some degree, Paul knows, of course, God gives gifts to mankind. Even unbelievers can produce beautiful art. But he sees through that and he doesn't just like, oh, beautiful art. He sees what the art, almost all of it then represents. It's full of idols, statues of different so-called gods everywhere. He, so he was waiting for them at Athens and his spirit was provoked within him. This is not sp talking about the Holy Spirit. This is his spirit, his human spirit. He's provoked deep within himself. He gets angry to a certain degree. Righteous anger against idolatry and blasphemy against God and care for the people in that city. He's provoked within him as he saw that the city was full of idols. This great center of Greek thought, full of idols, full of idols. And he's provoked as a result of it. He cannot just remain, you know, like calm and collected in that sense. Oh, I'll just enjoy the art and, you know, be quiet for a while and wait for uh, Paul and Silas, or uh, no, Silas and Timothy to arrive. What does he do? Well, he does whatever, basically what he does anywhere he goes, as Paul the Apostle. Verse 17, so he reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews, as was Paul's custom, and we see him here even earlier in uh, the beginning of this chapter. Let me read that. That's not the focus of our time today, the, like his uh, witness to the Jews. We'll look at his witness to the Gentiles and the pagan society as such. But uh, let me read to you a few verses earlier from this chapter. There, verse 1. Now when they had passed through Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica, where there was a synagogue of the Jews. And Paul went in, as was his custom. Notice there, that's his custom. He goes to a city. If there's a, a synagogue, he goes. As was his custom, and on three Sabbath days he reasoned with them from the scriptures, explaining and proving that it was necessary for the Christ to suffer and rise from the dead. And saying, this Jesus whom I proclaim to you is the Christ. And some of them were persuaded and joined Paul and Silas, as did a great many of the devout Greeks and not a few of the leading women. But the Jews were jealous. And then he continues on. So Paul would do that and he would go to the synagogue. And his approach in the synagogue is different than his approach here, as we'll see later. Why is that? Because he's speaking to a different audience. With the people in the synagogue, he, can, uh, he opens up the scriptures uh, right away. And, and they, he, he, doesn't, he, he doesn't need to begin with creation, for example, where he begins here. Because they already take that for granted. If, if he would do that, they would be like, well, yeah, we agree, we agree, of course we agree. You know, yes, you're right, Paul. So Paul gets right to the point where they disagree. And where the crucial importance is Christ is the Messiah. As he uses the scriptures to show he is the promised Messiah, it was necessary for him to suffer and die and rise from the dead. And his message is essentially obviously the same, but he needs to back up a little bit with a pagan audience, as I believe we need to back up in our day and age to almost every people we talk to or meet with, because unless they are, for example, Jewish uh, uh, believers who are like uh, Jews who know their Old Testament very well, and I, even, Jew, even uh, like Judaism today is not very... Jewish or Old Testament like it's more you know it's uh, based on uh, interpretations of the rabbis more than the actual Old Testament as such but that is a side note but he, unless a person is very well versed and already accepts some of these foundational things from the book of Genesis then yeah you go straight to that but most of the time I think it is important for us to have the same approach as Paul then has here in the text we are looking at as he speaks to these philosophers in Athens. Okay, so he did that 
uh, back to then verse 17 in chapter 17. He reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews and the devout persons. Devout persons is basically the, the God-fearing Gentiles. So the, the, those who had turned uh, fro to, to worship the, the one true God. Uh, and uh, he reasoned with them. But then he says, and in the marketplace every day with those who happened to be there. So in the marketplace and people would uh, be there and also this opportunity to meet people uh, and, and talk and, and even present ideas as we saw there later, especially here in Athens, people really wanted to they spend their time in doing nothing else except telling and hearing something new. <laughs> telling and hearing something new. They desired to. They didn't really care if they necessarily agreed with it or not, but they just, you know, tickled their interest. You know, like there's a lot of people like that. The university is full of them in many ways, and, and uh, so for people, you know, even in theology departments and philosophy, they don't necessarily believe any of it, they don't necessarily have any whatever, they just like ideas and they like to learn back and forth and kind of, uh, if there's something new, it's even more interesting and so forth. Uh, so he is in the marketplace and he talks with whoever he happens to be there. And then verse F. 18 there it says some of the Epicurean and Stoic philosophers also conversed with him so Paul the Apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ finds himself in conversation with these philosophers Epicurean and Stoic philosophers here we're not told more like you know we're told the names of these uh, phil uh, philosophers or philosophical systems can someone put the lights on? Yeah, thank you. Uh, that was not the light sign of, you know, like you need to leave soon. <laughs> like they might have it somewhere. Uh, so he finds himself talking with these Epicurean and Stoic philosophers. And uh, I'm certainly no expert in the philosophies of these systems, but as far as I know, and was like, you know, done some research. Uh, the Epicureans, and, and these two systems were basically two main philosophies of the day, uh, so they represented the kind of the main philosophical thought in Athens and, 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 and Greek culture at large. The Epicureans uh, were founded by a man called Epicurus, and uh, you know, you'd kind of guess something like that. And basically, if you really summarize it, apparently their, their main idea was kind of the, the pers pursuing pleasure, Pursuing pleasure and avoidance of pain, you know, so it's very uh, uh, kind of in that sense uh, Pleasure centered and uh, yeah avoidance of pain pursuing pleasure and if there is a God or gods They are very distant and so there's the aspect of kind of deism uh, Deism that God yeah, maybe there's a creator someone who kind of wind the clock on and then he left it going and he kind of He's away far away from that that hole so, it seems that the, these people basically, you could summarize it in that way. Belief in pleasure, avoidance of pain, uh, I think it sounds a lot like <laughs> much of modern thought, even though people might not have a clue about Epicurean philosophy. I think many people, it's very pleasure-centered, self-centered, and pain or sickness or death, you know, is the, you know, you can get people to do a lot of things with just even scaring them a little bit of pain or, or uh, sickness and things like that. Anyway, when God is distant. And then the Stoic philosophers, they were founded by a man called Zeno, apparently. And the Stoic had come from the name where they were meeting there. The, was it the stairs of Stoa or something like that? Anyway, they, they were a little bit almost the opposite in some ways. They accepted pain. And they almost like they believe in this kind of self-mastery and you just need to embrace all that comes your way and master yourself and, uh, and including the pain that comes. Uh, and apparently there's the idea of kind of pantheism that God is in everything uh, and, and so forth. Okay, again, I'm not any uh, specialist in these, uh, but just to give a basic idea, that seems to be the general gist of what these philosophies taught and represented. The text doesn't tell us more than the names here, of course, but we know from history. Um, 
By the way, the Stoic, Stoic philosophy seems to have made a little bit of a comeback. I think even this actual name, some of you might know even more, but I, I've heard some you know, people who actually identify even still today as it, you know, Stoic philosophy. So it's not all in the past in that sense either. Well, they, they come to him, they come and talk to, the Paul, to Paul. And what do they say? It says, and some said, what does this babbler wish to say? What does this babbler wish to say? So Paul was talking, I know this new guy in Athens, and he's saying things. New ideas, we're interested in new ideas. They say, what does this babbler wish to say? And babbler is a good translation, it captures the idea of, of what they're saying. But the literal, what they're exactly kind of saying is, what does this seed picker have to say? What does this scavenger have to say? What, do, what does this idea picker? Why do they say that? Well, they as the great philosophers of Athens see Paul, this Jewish man, preaching some weird things. And they're basically mocking him. Even before they hear more from him, they're like this babbler, this seed picker. What does seed picker in this context then mean? It seems like they're referencing to the fact that you know we're a sophisticated cultural philosophical elite who know how to present philosophical ideas and arguments and understand them but this guy is like a bird that just picks around for seed and maybe then spits some of the seed back and like he's maybe he gets some ideas from different philosophies and he doesn't even understand them himself Maybe even bird brain could be a similar, you know, like modern version of that. But babbler, it's an insult. The seed picker. You know, he's, you know even the Holman Christian uh, Standard Bible, in a uh, relatively new English uh, translation, translates this pseudo-intellectual. What does this pseudo-intellectual have to say to us? And I don't think uh, the day we live in is, would be much different if Paul was walking around the streets of Finland, so to say, and preaching the same message, or you know, in you know, going talking with the professor of philosophy from whatever major university in Finland, and preaching the faithful biblical gospel. Maybe they might, especially Finnish people, more polite and stuff, they might not be this outright, but this is what they would think. You know, what is babble? What is this? And even us as Christians, we might hear this from friends or co-workers, fellow students, or other we meet, you know, this mocking. You're one of those fundamentalist, narrow-minded, bigoted, homophobic, whatever, you know, you're just a bird brain, seed picker, pseudo-intellectual. You know, there's no, we are the sophisticated ones, we're the ones who believe in science, uh, and so forth. Uh, what does this babbler wish to say? And others said, he seems to be a preacher of foreign divinities. So he seems to be preaching foreign, so uh, strange to them, and uh, outside of the, the Greek uh, culture and so forth, foreign divinities. And notice, not a foreign deity, singular, foreign divinities. Did Paul preach multiple divine beings in that sense? Did he preach multiple gods? Was Paul a believer in polytheism, that there's many gods? Of course not, of course not. He believed in one true God. And that was his message, obviously, uh, the, the triune God, the Trinity, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Uh, but it's one God, three persons. But why would they say foreign divinities? Notice what the rest of the verse clarified. He seems to be a for preacher of foreign divinities because he was preaching Jesus and the resurrection. In these guys, the sophisticated philosophical elite who think themselves so smart, they were actually, it seems to be so foolish at this point, they didn't even understand what Paul was preaching. They thought Paul was preaching two divinities, G deities, Jesus, and then this person called Anastasis, the resurrection. Because the Greek word for resurrection, Anastasis, I even have, you know, my faithful brother in Espo, Tommy Matika, one of his children, Anastasia, you know, Anastasia, and we heard Anastasia, it's resurrection. And even back, in, back then, also, the word resurrection was apparently functioned sometimes even as a woman's name. So they thought Paul is preaching Jesus and another deity, Anastasis, uh, a, a woman. Obviously, he's not preaching that. 
He's preaching the resurrection of Jesus and the resurrection, how it even relates to believers and so forth. Uh, but that's what they thought. He seems to be a preacher of foreign deities, Jesus and the resurrection. They were right. He preached Jesus, and they were certainly right that Paul preached the resurrection of Jesus. They seem to have misunderstood that. Uh, but now Paul will get to that uh, resurrection here in his mini-sermon. Okay, so that's what they say. And then verse 19, And they took him and brought him to the Areopagus. So they were in a marketplace where everyone was is free, you know, you can go and exchange of ideas. But now he's met these philosophical elite of the town and they're interested and then they're, we're going to, you know, come with us, come with us. Sometimes people were taken to Areopagus, like held for trial, for actual, like, you know, actual trial and questioning. And maybe, you know, you could even be, uh, get a sentence uh, of, if I understood right, even some people maybe lose their life as a result. But they, they, it was like a court almost. Paul is not there on trial in, to that degree, but they want to hear him out. And apparently even Socrates, you know, the great philosopher, even way, way past, before Paul, Socrates was on trial in this very place back in the day, in, in the Areopagus. So the Areopagus uh, basically is this council, this group of leaders, the elite, it seems to be that they were the at the very least, the educational and philosophical religious elite of the city of Athens. Uh, maybe in the past even more, kind of almost like the governing body of the whole uh, town. But they, at least, at least before, the question is then, were they actually at this point still meeting at the hill of uh, uh, Ares or not? You know, it doesn't... But, it's not for sure if they were actually at that place or a different place. It doesn't really matter there. But the name comes from that place where they used to meet. So they, this council met at the hill of Ares, and it's called the Areopagus. But uh, it's not so much the place that's the point. It's the people. It's the council. It's this judicial body who decides certain matters uh, in um, Athens. And they want to now hear out the new guy. The new guy who has weird ideas because they want to hear new things. And they want to learn to some degree, even though they're mocking him to begin with. So they took him and brought him to the Areopagus saying, May we know what this new teaching is that you are presenting. For you bring some strange things to our ears. We wish to know therefore what these things mean. As we see, this doesn't mean that they have genuine desire to learn the biblical gospel, but they are interested in learning new things. They like philosophical debate and thought. So they bring him in before this council. And then verse 21, as I've already referenced and we've read, it says, Now all the Athenians, all the Athenians and the foreigners who lived there, and this is also very you know, broad. It's basically, this is the air that you breathe in Athens. If you're an Athenian, you're interested in basically doing nothing except telling and hearing something new. And obviously they did, but you, know, it's, you get the point. What, what the, they, they really like to converse uh, ideas. Some people are like this still today. And there's good things about learning, obviously. Uh, if it's with the right motives. They would spend their time in nothing except telling and hearing something new. So then, verse 22, how does Paul, the apostle of Christ, how does he present himself? It says, so Paul standing in the midst of the Areopagus, in the midst of this you know, ruling elite of this great city of Athens, the center of Greek thought, culture, philosophy, and religion. And he now stands, not just before people in the marketplace, not just in the synagogue, but before the cultural, philosophical elite of the city. Paul raises his voice and starts preaching. And he says, men of Athens, 
I perceive that in every way you are very religious. As even with the Lord Jesus Christ, if you've noticed, when the Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of the Apostle Paul, when Jesus rebukes people, he often begins with saying something good even. You know, he often even us, it's a good practice in many ways. If you have something good to say about the person before you're going to rebuke them, sometimes it's good, you know, to begin softly and, you know, there's certain kind of compliment uh, in that. Uh, so I believe, you know, that's what Paul doing. Uh, but it seems to be, it could also be a little bit of a backhanded compliment as he continues on. Uh, the King James translates it, I think, I perceive that you are very superstitious. Maybe that's taking it a little bit too far. I don't think Paul was like mockingly saying you're very superstitious and then they're right away angry at him. But this word that is here translated in the ESV, very religious, uh, can be used in a positive, like very devout, very, you know, very religious in a good way, or in a negative way, like very superstitious. So it can be used both ways. And I think that in that way, it seems to be a little bit like a backhanded compliment that at the end of the day, okay, you're very committed, but you're actually committed to superstition and not the one true God, as he'll get to when he talks about the temples, the God who made everything. So, you're very religious. How does he know it? He says, verse 30, 23, For as I passed along and observed the worst objects of your worship. And notice again, Paul in Athens, he's walking around. Paul, as a preacher of Christ, as a Christian man, he has his eyes open. He has his eyes open. He doesn't just... Say, you know, obviously they have Bibles bound like this, but he doesn't, for example, just walk around Athens with his Old Testament scroll around and saying, this is the only thing that matters. You know, I'll just like keep on reading and I'll just like robotically open my mouth and just say the exact same thing as I've told, you know, like this kind of, I'm like a robot messenger who just quotes scripture. No, he believes that the word of God is the Word of God and the Bible and the Scripture, but yet he recognizes that God has created us in this world and He's created others and given us the ability to learn, to perceive, and to, in different contexts, use with skill, with wisdom, connect it to the hearers that are there to the best of your ability to make the biblical truth bear in that situation. To make biblical truth bear in that situation. And as he walks around Athens, he observes. He looks around, where am I? Who are these people? What can I learn from these people? By even seeing the objects of their worship. And that's why his spirit was provoked, full of idols. And then he's talking with people in the marketplace. He never compromises his message, but yet... He is willing to learn because he cares for the people. He's willing to learn about their idolatry to a certain point so that he can show the foolishness of their idolatry. We are called to love God and love other people. And part of that is then observing and reading the sign of the times, so to say. A Christian cannot be completely oblivious to the age that they live in. There's an aspect, not to be overly, you know, everything about news and everything about culture or whatever, but to a certain degree, you need to know where you are, what the time is that God has placed you in, what is the general ideas that people around you who you meet, what are the kind of thinking they have, so that you can expose their false thinking in the light of the Word of God. And that's why I think this is a very good and important reminder for us. So even though we might never, well, we'll never be in the exact same situation, we might never even be in a similar situation where we are preaching to the, you know, cultural elite of a major city. But 
even in one-to-one -one conversation with friends or family or strangers, the basic idea, the thought, the attitude of us should be the same as Paul and the message should be the same as Paul. Anyway, he observes. So he says, I observed the objects of your worship. So I've seen how many objects of your worship you are. So you take things seriously to that degree. That's, you know, you're very religious. You make a lot of statues. You put a lot of time and energy into this. So yes, to some, you know, you are very religious. It's not necessarily a very good thing at the end of the day, but you are very religious. They would have probably taken it as a great compliment until he gets to the end of his message. But then he says, as he was looking around, he found one statue, one object of worship that said to the unknown God. And Paul then uses this as his kind of bridge to show them the foolishness of their system and how they need the one true God. Does Paul believe that they're actually like, okay, does Paul, for example, does Paul just say, hey guys, you got all this st statues, good job you got the unknown one, you're good, you're good, you know, you're, you're in your ignorance, you're worshiping the one true God, even though you're ignorant of him, you know, see you later, I'll continue on somewhere else, you don't need any help, you know, all religions lead to God anyway. No, of course not. He doesn't say anything like that. But he uses it to show that even you yourselves, even you yourselves with all this multitude of idols recognize that there's a statue to the unknown God. And this unknown God, which is unknown to you, is actually the only one true God whom you should worship. You are in ignorance, repent and believe. He uses this as the connecting point. And uh, Paul understands that humans have been created in the image of God. And there's such a thing as general revelation. God reveals himself in creation. And God gives people, you know, common sense and, and, and a certain awareness of him as God. So, not everything that unbelievers do or say is wrong. As we'll see, Paul will start quoting poets, you know, here in just a moment. Unbelieving, non-Christian, you know, uh, pagan poets. But because Paul is so well grounded in the word of God, and that's what it's based on, when he sees in culture, when he sees in poetry, he sees in false idol statues, he can use that because he knows, well, actually, in that part, you are right. And I'll use that, <laughs> you know, that, all that is false. But in that part, you, you, you're, there's part of truth. You get your own to something. And let me show you how that what you're on to by the common grace of God, let me show you how that in itself even is contradicting the rest of your system and let me preach to you the only one true God. We need to, in the time and age that we live in, just like every other Christian has lived in other times and ages, allotted by God, like we will see here later in Paul's sermon, we need to be aware, we need to care for people enough to know generally what's going on and how to then most accurately and faithfully connect the biblical truth to different situations and show them the foolishness and the hopelessness of their philosophies and ideas that they are uh, committed to. Anyway, so Paul says, what therefore you worship as unknown, this I proclaim to you. But it's not just one God in the midst of other statues. In fact, this unknown to them is the only true God. That's why he says, verse 24, The God who made the world and everything in it, being Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in temples made by man. This is not just one deity who controls the seas or controls the harvest or controls human fertility or whatever other thing it might be. This is the creator God who made everything. He made everything. Where does this come from? The book of Genesis. The book of Genesis. So, 
why is it so important? Why, why have we been spending over a year already in the book of Genesis? And, you know, many, many months going through the first, you know, few chapters of the creation account and thinking through the implications of that. Is that we need to have a really, really robust and foundational understanding that God is the creator. God is the creator. And if we truly understand this biblically, everything else kind of follows from that. And also, as we then speak to people, we need to emphasize this point. We need to begin with God as creator because most people don't begin there. You know, they, they're brainwashed with the modern-day philosophy of so-called science in evolutionary thinking or, or in, anything else that kind of connects to it. And uh, they're like, ah, oh, you know, how foolish for you to believe that God created in six days. Or how foolish for you to believe that, you know, evolution is not right and so forth. But that's where it all starts. God is the creator. So we begin by preaching, by speaking, by thinking creation. God as creator is the foundational point that we need to understand ourselves and make sure that others understand us. He is the Lord of heaven and does not live in temples by man. Think about Paul. He's there in Athens. There's temples all over the place. Great temples. He probably showed, he probably as he was preaching in the midst, he was probably like, he does not dwell in temples made by hand. You know, kind of pointing. And these statues, and then he's talking about the statues. He's going straight at them. He's going straight at them. Sometimes people misinterpret this, like Paul is just trying to find a common ground, and that's only his, the only thing he's doing. Yes, he finds common ground in order to show why it's false. And then he, he goes exactly after uh, their wrong views. He does not live in temples made by man. And actually in the book of Acts earlier, let me just briefly read to you, Acts chapter 7, verse 48. Remember what happens here. And this is an interesting thing. Who preached similar words before Paul preached these words? Who preached similar words, made even the same kind of statement, when Paul still hated Christians, who was the one who killed this man who preached these similar words? It was the same Paul who later is the one preaching that message. In Acts 7, verse 48. Let me read from there. I'm kind of... Jumping in, but this is Stephen, the first Christian martyr. Stephen's sermon. We're here at the end of his sermon. What does Stephen say? Verse, uh, you know, he's preaching to the Jewish audience. He's going through about the Old Testament, Moses, Abraham, and all these things. And then in verse uh, 47, it says, But it was Solomon who built a house for him. So Old Testament, there was temples, obviously. Solomon built a temple. And then Stephen says, Verse 48, yet the Most High does not dwell in houses made by hands. So even though even God uh, the, the, uh, appointed and commanded certain temples uh, to be built, there was never the belief that he actually, like, in that sense, dwells or needs them, uh, as was different than the audience that Paul is now preaching to. But Stephen said, yet the Most High does not dwell in houses made by hands, as the prophet says. Then he quotes from Psalm 11, he says, Heaven is my throne and the earth is my footstool. What kind of house will you build for me, says the Lord? Or what is the place of my rest? Did not my hand make all these things? You, and then back to Stephen, verse 51. You stiff-necked people, uncircumcised in your heart and ears. You always resist the Holy Spirit. Let me stop there. Last week we looked at Abraham's circumcision. And I briefly mentioned there obviously like circumcision... Uh, the, even in that sense, it's later used by God himself, the circumcision of the heart. That that's, if you're uncircumcised in your heart, you're an unbeliever. And here, he is speaking to actual circumcised Jews, and says, yes, you're uncircumcised in your heart. 
You always resist the Holy Spirit. As your fathers did, so do you. Which of the prophets did your fathers not persecute? And they killed those who announced beforehand the coming of the righteous one. The righteous one. The Messiah. Whom you have now betrayed and murdered. You who received the law as delivered by angels and did not keep it. Stephen is preaching quite a sermon. That he's, not like, he's not pulling any punches. He's, you know, he's going straight. He's preaching to a Jewish audience. Why am I reading this? The rest of it is now. We'll get to it. Here, verse 54. Now when they heard these things, they were enraged. And they ground their teeth at him. But he, full of the Holy Spirit, gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God. And Jesus standing at the right hand of God. And he said, Behold, I see the heavens opened. And the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. The Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. But they cried out with a loud voice and stopped their ears and rushed together at him. And they cast him out of the city and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their garments at the feet of a young man named Saul. And as they were stoning Stephen, he called out, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And falling to his knees, he cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. And verse 1 of chapter 8, And Saul approved of his execution. This Saul... As you well, well know, this is Paul. And this is, the, I think it's just, you know, marvelous to think and remember how God had mercy on this uh, man who hated and killed Christians, who, killed, uh, who uh, approved the first martyrdom. And now he's the one being questioned not stoned to death here, no, he's just mocked later, you know, he has a lot of different trials in his life. But this Paul is now saying similar words to his audience, which is a Greek uh, philosophical audience. He do God does not dwell in temples made by human hands, just like Stephen, whom he heard and had executed earlier. Obviously, Paul repented of that as he came to Christ and asked sought for forgiveness. Okay, back to, as we uh, still look at the end of here in Act 17. So verse 25 in Act 17, it says, Nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything, since he himself gives all mankind and breath, all mankind life and breath and everything. Everything that is and exists, every good gift, everything is from God. Everything is from God. The pleasure that you Epicureans so seek for is from God. Even the pain, the, 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 the suffering is part of the sovereign plan of God. Your very breath is a gift from God. He gives life and breath and everything. And then he says, verse 26, And he made from one Man, every nation of mankind to live on the face of the earth. Where does he get that? Who is the one man? Adam. Adam. And obviously then there's even Noah, you know, as we've been seeing, it kind of narrows down then from Noah. This would have again, you know, the Greek, you know, we're the great Greeks. We got our philosophical systems. We're very proud of our heritage. Wait a minute. We're all, all humans are actually from one man. You know, it kind of goes against like national pride and thinking that we are just something special. Paul reminds, no, we come from one man, Adam. Adam. One man. Every nation of mankind God has made. We need to have a robust, biblical, clear understanding of the history of mankind that we all came from Adam, created by God and all the nations of mankind as we saw in Babel and so forth, to live on the face of the earth. And then he says, have, God has determined allotted periods and boundaries of their dwelling place. The fact that you live today in this moment of time in Tampere or Finland at the moment or are here this very day is part of the predetermined plan of God. 
We should seek to live the life that He's given us in this age to the best of our ability of faithfulness to Christ. Like Paul did in his day and Christians ever since. I mean before. Why? Why have been been created? Why are we, for example, in this point of time, verse 27, that they should seek God. Mankind has been created to seek God, to turn to Him. That's why God has created us, to worship Him. It says, and perhaps feel their way toward Him and find Him. Unfortunately, mankind on their own, as we see Paul explain more in Romans chapter 1, mankind on their own, they know that God exists, they're without excuse, Romans 1, 21, but they reject, they, they, they know that's true, but they do not believe it, they reject it and worship false gods. And God lets them go. God, like, you go your ways then. You go your ways and to destruction. But God has created mankind to seek Him, to turn to Him. And then Paul says, actually, He's not far from each one of us. It's not like God is far. It's not like the Epicureans believe that, okay, maybe there's a God, but He's very distant. He's like, He just wound the clock on, made the clock, and now He's left the place. He's, you know, He cannot be heard from. He's not involved in the affairs of human life and history anymore. No, the biblical understanding is that God is not far at all. He's present. He, he, he's not pantheistic. He's not in the material. He created the material. So it's not like what the Stoics seem to believe in pantheism, that He's in everything. But He's present everywhere. He knows all things. And He's not far from us in that sense. He's not far from us if you come to Him the right way through the Lord Jesus Christ. He's not far from each one of us. And because Paul knows this biblically, he knows this is true, God is near to those who call upon Him. He again, he, he's aware of poetry. He, said, he quotes a poet, apparently a Cretan poet named Epi, Epimenides, Epimenides, if I said that right. Anyway, Cretan poet Epimenides. In fact, Paul later quotes apparently from the same poem that this is quoted from, he quotes even in the letter of Titus, chapter 1, verse 12, when it says, you know, Cretans are lazy gluttons, you know, whatever. That was from the uh, poem of uh, the same man. Paul used pagan poetry to illustrate the point that they would get, because, not because, Paul, Paul didn't believe this because the poet said so. Paul believed it because the Bible says so, and he understands that, and he connects it and shows that even your own poets have enough common sense in some of these things. In him we live and have a move of being, as even some of your own poets have said, and then, for we are indeed his offspring, which is a quote from another poem, apparently a guy called, named Aratus, uh, apparently from the region where Paul was from. So he quotes poets. And then he shows, okay, even you recognize this. You recognize it because it's true and there's a certain kind of general grace that you're able to get certain things right, even though you worship false gods. And then he argues and shows the foolishness of what they are practicing. He shows the inconsistency. He says, being then of God's offspring, we ought not to think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone, an image formed by the art and imagination of man. So why do you do this? Even you recognize that if we are his offspring, how come if we are more complicated and greater than a statue, and you think the gods are essentially statues, and that's how you worship your so-called gods? That doesn't even make sense in your own system. And then he comes to the key point in his message. Verse 30, he says, The time of ignorance God overlooked, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent. So there's an aspect that people are always uh, held accountable by God, but God has not brought immediate judgment. He has overlooked he has passed over former sins, like in Romans chapter 3, 25. And there hasn't, God has not come in immediate judgment. 
The Gentiles, the pagans, are held accountable, like Romans chapter 1. They know that God exists and they, and they yet re, re, uh, reject Him. They're held accountable by God and the wrath of God is poured uh, down upon them, like in Romans chapter 1, Paul says about that. But, he says, yeah, you, ha you know, God has not come in judgment. He's overlooked these times of ignorance. But now, there's this call to repentance for you. Now he commands all people everywhere to repent. You've been held accountable by the creation that God has created. And you've been held accountable by your conscience as non-Jewish, uh, non-Hebrew people. You haven't had the scriptures. You've been held accountable by God, by general revelation. But now here is special revelation. The proclamation of scripture, the gospel to everyone. And it's a command. Now he commands all people everywhere to repent. Everyone. And this applies still today. This was not in Paul's day. So we need to speak to people. We need to tell people. We need to believe this first of ourselves. And ourselves be people who believe in the Creator, the one true God. Turn to Him in repentance and faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. And this should be our message. A message of repentance. Why does Paul say that? Repentance, turning away from sin. He says... 31, because he has fixed the day on which he will judge the world in righteousness. There is coming a day, men of the Areopagus and people still today, there is coming a day that is fixed by God. Fixed by God and he has appointed a man, a man. Think about this. Who is the one by whom they will be judged? He will judge the world in righteousness by a man. This is the seed of the woman, the promise. Genesis again, the descendant of Abraham, the promised one, the Messiah, the one that Stephen called the righteous one. The Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. The Lion of Judah which will one day come. He is the one, the man. And this is the man. In some ways, if we, if we want to like here, it's not with the capital. It's a, a man, it's emphasizing that he's man. But if we think, you know, Jesus, the man, the one true and perfect man. Our Lord, the perfect one. He is appointed by God. And this would have been, they would have mocked, what on earth? This is not sophisticated. You're like, why believe some Galilean, you know, uh, woodworker, man, is the one who will judge us? What insanity. This is not sophisticated philosophy. What, a, what an insane message you have. Paul? Like Paul then says in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, what does he say? Chapter 1 verse 18, For the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. Where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through him, it pleased God through the folly of what we preach to save those who believe. For Jews demand signs and Greeks seek wisdom. Paul is talking to the Greeks here, of course. But we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to the Jews and folly to the Gentiles. But those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than men and the weakness of God is stronger than men. And then it continues on how God uses the foolishness to sa save His people. This, it was foolish to their ears, but this is the true message. And then he gets to that last part that we need to remember and understand. So, creation... 
from that the history of mankind, Adam, we all come from Adam, and as Adam fell and sinned, we have all sinned, and there, there leads to the message of repentance, repentance, turning away from sin, confessing your sins to a holy God, recognizing that the one who will judge is the man appointed, and uh, Paul basically gets cut off early here. He doesn't get to finish his sermon. <laughs> so in some ways we get the beginning. You know, they start mocking him and so forth. But I believe he would have even expounded more as we see in other places. He would have explained more about Jesus and having faith in him and so forth. That what he did in the marketplace, he, he, he got further there and, and so forth. But specifically this one thing that this man, how has God shown that this is the man. God, has, uh, God will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed. And of this, of the fact that this is the man who will judge the world in righteousness, of this God has given assurance to all. The men in Athens were given by God assurance that this is the man by the fact that God had raised him from the dead. A historical reality of the physical resurrection of Christ. The men of Athens hadn't seen it with their eyes. There were you know, many hundreds of people who saw it. And now Paul proclaims that message. And the message itself is enough now to keep them accountable. But God has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. The Christian faith rests on this crucial foundational truth of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. Without the physical bodily resurrection, which is what resurrection means, you don't have Christianity, you don't have a gospel message. And this in especially, the doctrine of the resurrection would have been kind of the final straw as we see Get this babbler out. You know, they don't say that there, but it's like, that's just insane. Why? Because in Greek thought, okay, resurrection, like it says there, verse 32, when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked. Why would they mock? Because in Greek philosophy and thought, that's not something we would even like to happen. In Greek thought, the idea and the desire is to escape the physical body basically escape this physical existence and just i don't know like evaporize into some kind of spiritual uh, existence but biblical christianity what paul preached and what the bible teaches is physical resurrection of the lord jesus christ and we will be raised like him we believe in the resurrection of believers, like the Apostles' Creed, one of the most kind of ancient, short uh, summaries uh, of Christian doctrine. Remember, Apostles' Creed, I believe, and then there's so many other things. Then there's that Jesus rose on the third day from the dead. Yes? And then, how does it end the whole Apostles' Creed? We believe in the resurrection of the body. The resurrection of our body in the future because we belong to Christ. And this was an offense to Greeks of the day. The Greek thinking, the mindset of the people there. But this is the message. And this is what Christianity is. The message of repentance, God will judge the earth by a man whom he has appointed and only in this man, only in this message that he was preaching Jesus and the resurrection, only in this is their hope, only in this is their life. But they mocked him and then others said, we will hear you again about this. So yeah, maybe come back another time, but your time is up, you know, the, the council has heard enough. So that's what I mean. It seems like they cut him off. Paul would have kept on going and opened it more. But we see enough here. We see enough and we know how we would have, he would have obviously talked more about, the, opened it even more about faith in Christ and so forth. So verse 33, Paul went from their midst. But some men joined him and believed. Some men. 
In fact, one is here told, among whom also were Dionysius the Areopagite. What does it mean Dionysius the Areopagite? He was one of the members of the council. Most of the council, it seems, mocked him. Some maybe wanted to hear a little bit more, some mocked. At least one from the actual council joined Paul and believed in this righteous one, the Lord Jesus Christ, who has been raised from the dead. He became a believer. He was converted by the power of God, as Paul proclaimed the gospel of God. And also it mentions, and a woman named Damaris and others with them. This woman was not part of the um, Areopagite council. She, she probably wasn't even there, uh, because as far as we know, they, they weren't allowed or, and so forth. But she was probably some of the people in the marketplace. She'd heard Paul preach there. Some of the people from the marketplace, this woman, the Marys, and others with them, maybe Lydia and others who were connected to this, they heard the gospel and they believed. And the same is true still today. God uses His people when they are a message of the gospel. Most people will mock and ridicule. We just say, yeah, that's what we expect. Be, uh, you know, be very concerned. Be very concerned if the message and the witness you have as a Christian never causes anyone to mock your message. Be very, very concerned. Because that would mean that your message is not the same as the message of the Lord Jesus Christ. Your message is not the same as the Apostle Paul. Your message is not the same as the Bible. So we expect them to mock, whether it's the philosophical elites or anyone else. We expect them to mock, but we love them. We want to understand to a degree what they believe so that we can show the foolishness of their belief and call them to turn to the one true God, to believe in Him, to trust in Him, to turn from empty idols to the living God. This is what Paul did. And some believed, and some will conti some continue to believe today. And may God continue to use us to bring others to Himself. But it is for us to be faithful. It is not for us to be in charge of the results. We are messengers. We've been given a message, and God uses us according to His purpose. And that's why we need to be grounded in biblical theology. That's why we need to really, really know the book of Genesis, especially the beginnings, to really, really understand and to have this deep in our hearts so we can preach this message to a pagan society where we live in and reminding of the Creator God, repentance and faith in the resurrected Lord Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you that you are God. We thank you that you have not left us in the sin and the judgment that we deserve. We thank you that you have sent your Son, the man, the Lord Jesus Christ. He became man, truly God, truly man, for sinful men and women like us. He lived a perfect life the righteous one, the promised one, right from the beginning, the seed of the woman who will crush the head of the serpent, the wounded, victorious Messiah. We thank you, Lord Jesus, that you came and you died for us and you rose on the third day, bodily, physical resurrection. And we look forward to the day when we will be with you in our resurrected bodies, worshipping you for eternity on the new heavens and the new earth. And may we be grounded in the teaching and the truth of Scripture, and may you give us love toward other people, to care enough for them to preach this message, even if they mock us, even if they hate us, even in worst cases like with Stephen, he was killed. 
He gave his life as the first martyr. And yet we see that the man who approved the execution is this man, the Apostle Paul, who then later preaches this same message. Lord, forgive us of our cowardice, forgive us of our unbelief, and help us to be strengthened in the knowledge of your word. We might be faithful men and women in whatever conversations and situations we find ourselves in, that you will use us to be witnesses of Christ, that we might with joy see people some of them believe, most of them we assume will mock, but give us the joy of seeing people turn to you and use us for your purposes. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.